Hi everybody, it's me. It's Dr. Kessler from Lorain County Community College, um, and uh, um, welcome to today's co-video. Um, first of all, I want to uh, mention my temperature today. Um, you saw me put a mask on when I first started here, and I also I want to report my temperature. Um, I want to reiterate that this is a personal behavior kind of a thing. Today's uh, um, title, I guess, would be uh, behavior versus biology. So behavior versus biology or behavior versus immunity or immunity versus behavior. Um, what is the best thing? And, and I'll give you a little clue. Both are important. Both are important here. Um, first of all, my temperature is 96.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, that is 35.8 centigrade. Um, and I can tell you that uh, um, uh, that means that I am not going to be too terribly concerned about going out. But if I do go out, I'm going to be very careful because of uh, um, I can look at this new alert system, which is based on that program that came out of, uh, of the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, and uh, it is a way of locally tracking your level of risk. Um, and uh, there's a number of criteria that go into putting you in a particular category or not, and that includes no number of hospitalizations, etc. Right now in Florida, Arizona, Texas, and parts of California, they are going through something very similar to this, um, and it is, uh, and they're all up at the very uh, extreme levels. Um, all right, so as you can see here, we have different color. It's a color coded. I like color coding. Um, it's a good thing to do. We have yellow, which is, um, you know, there's active exposure and spread going on, but it's a small level of concern. Um, in level two, you should be cautious. Lorain County is a, a level two. Neighboring Cuyahoga County is a uh, level three, where you should be a little bit more cautious. Um, and the only other thing I want to talk about on this uh, on this chart here is uh, um, Columbus is in Franklin County, and they are currently at level uh, uh, three, approaching four, where it gets really really serious. All right, I want to talk a little bit about going forward, where things are going, and 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 there is reason for optimism and pessimism, as you can imagine. Um, first of all, I want to uh, talk about reasons for optimism, and this came out of the Centers for Disease Control last week, um, where they published a preliminary study. This is not published data yet. I just want to throw that out there as a caution. Um, but what they did was they actually looked for zero prevalence in laboratory samples. So you go to the various laboratories, and if I can look at, we can look at this map of the United States. We have the New York area, we have Missouri, Minnesota, Louisiana, Florida, um, San Francisco, and, um, and uh, Washington. And go to those commercial laboratories and ask, well, how many people are infected um, by surveying the blood? These are not people that are going for COVID tests. These are people who are going to say, if I want to get my cholesterol taken, I would go get my cholesterol taken, and uh, I, they would have some blood there. So while the blood's sitting there, how's about we look at it for, for um, um, obviously blindly, because I didn't submit to that test, but how about we look at it blindly to see if there is a, a seroprevalence there. Um, and um, what they found, and depending on the place, now we're looking back. This is a look back experiment. This is they did this back in in April, um, in March, and I will tell you that um, those these data um, are are still going on. They're still collecting this information and trying to make sense of it um, as we speak. But what they found was was that there, there was uh, um, a bit more people infected in South Florida than they had assumed. Um, they, had, uh, um, they had about 10,000 cases, and, uh, um, and, and they, they estimated a serial prevalence that is the, of, of about 1.85, and if you take that, that amount and multiply um, by the population, you come up with, well, about 117,000. Um, 
So at this point in the game, by the way, Florida has, and I can't remember off, offhand where it is right now, but I think it's approaching 100,000 people infected. So if you do that simple math, does that mean that there's 1 million? That's a jump. That's a conclusion. Um, and I guess more data will be needed to actually prove that this is the case. Um, so that means there's more people infected which means there's more people who are what we call um, asymptomatic, um, who are infected um, and don't know they're infected. Um, and in fact, last week I told you a little bit about this that is about 10 times. This is the actual information. I suspected it was five times based on data back um, from China earlier on. Let's go down to New York City for a second. And if you look at New York City, you see that uh, this is way, way back. Obviously, there's 400,000 people infected in New York area, um, in the New York State now. Um, but back then, there was about 53,000, and this is uh, um, late March. And, uh, um, and they did the seroprevalence, and it came to about 6.93%, which they estimated is about 641 so if you were to carry that data through and look at New York today, that's about, it said, the assumption is about 12 times higher. Let's make it 10 so the math is easy. And that's going to take us from 400,000 to 4 million. 4 million people in the New York City area, well, that's, that's a pretty decent number. That's a good number of people, a good fraction of people. Um, are some of you uh, um, hearing what I'm saying or have you heard of what I'm thinking of here? Um, so that might indicate uh, something going on um, there. Um, I'm just going to let that go for a second. Um, that takes us to um, New York. I just want to go back to New York and ask the question, what's going on in New York? Are those 4 million people that I estimate, just spitball calculate, who are uh, positive, are those people, um, are they actually protected because there's enough people there that are uh, um, infected, so so-called herd immunity, or is it just that the people of New York are really, really good people and they, uh, um, and, you know, they have good behavior? Um, I'll remind you, I grew up in New York, and I just want to point that out, that I grew up in New York. And, and, and I know New Yorkers are great people, but they're also kind of independent, and they kind of are independent thinkers of their own, but whatever. Um, let's assume that maybe it is something like that. Maybe, or maybe a combination of both. Maybe it is good behavior and a little bit of an extra immunity. Well, then along comes last week a public publication in The Lancet about Spain. And Spain is um, obviously had a huge struggle um, with, the, uh, with, with the, the infection, and they are recovered pretty much. Um, their level of infection is all the way down. And the question is, um, are they, is it their behavior or is it their uh, um, immunity? Is there some sort of a herd immunity? By the way, there's other things that also can determine whether you get uh, um, uh, immunity. It might not be necessarily an antibody level. It might be something else along the line. It could be uh, resistance. There are people with genetic resistance. We already talked about genetics before. It could be a little bit of genetics in there. There are other reasons that, that you get, um, you know, virus needs a host. And a host is either dead, a host is either resistant, immune, or sequestered, hidden away. So those are the possibilities for a virus uh, going away. So if you look at the Spanish uh, data, though, um, what they come up with is that there is about, um, well, it looks like from the data here, no more than 13% seroprevalence. Um, and is that enough? Most people believe that you need at least about 70% of the population to achieve herd immunity. So is that what's going on? Or are the Spaniard, Spaniards super careful? Are they being super, super safe? Um, and again, um, it's probably a little bit of both here. I think that there might be something going on. Now, in all of these studies, let me just point out, 
by the way. The Lancet one is in a publication. The one for the CDC is working on being published pretty soon. Um, but in all of these all of these stories, you have to rely on a little bit of faith in the testing procedures themselves. Um, and in every test you've ever imagined, in any test you have, there is always a certain number of false positives and false negatives. That's just the way it is. Um, and, uh, um, you know, when we're comparing apples, are we comparing apples to apples or apples to oranges here? Hard to say. Um, at any rate, we know that things are very good in, in Spain and things are very good in New York and I'm hoping that they continue. Um, I think we need to um, in, in both of those places continue um, to protect ourselves. We also obviously these studies in both both in Europe and in uh, America need more work. There is a lot of lab bench work that can be done. For instance, is there uh, neutralizing antibodies? Is there immunity that you can measure in a test tube um, in all of these studies? Those are, are, are those kinds of uh, things are coming um, along the way. Um, last thing I'm going to do is leave you with uh, um, uh, this map. This is now, I haven't shown you this map in a while. This is a map of the entire world and you can see where there are still some uh, um, uh, increasing cases and it's a heat map. The best color here is uh, is white. The next best is blue and uh, um, some of these other colors in here, the various shades, the darker red it is, the worse it is. So um, my, uh, my hat's off to the people in uh, Australia right now. I understand Melbourne may be under a lockdown. Um, but there is an end. I think there is an end in sight, and I'm very hopeful. Um, I want you all to remember to uh, be good to each other, and uh, um, may you all persist like a lentivirus. Okay.